All right, good morning, guys. I'm going to try to make this a quick video. I always say that, and then I don't, right? So um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about minimally invasive spine surgery briefly. This is my car talk, we'll call it, on the road talk, and then I'll have a, a talk where I show uh, illustrations like I did the other day from my home computer. But first, I want to remind everybody that I am giving away a free Spine Center of uh, Texas t-shirt. I know that's just so exciting. All you got to do is go to my Facebook page, Spine Center of Texas Facebook page. Go on the left. There's a spot that says join my mailing list and just simply give us your email. And I'm going to be basically uh, choosing randomly from uh, those emails. And once you enter, every time I give away a free t-shirt or whatever I give away, I'll be drawing from that uh, list of people. And so all you got to do is put your email on there once. And uh, I don't plan on inundating you with tons of emails. In fact, I haven't even really sent one out yet. But it will be... Uh, uh, you know, medically related, nutritionally related, spine related things. So I'm just going to mention this. I've had a couple people ask me questions about minimally invasive surgery, and uh, I'm just going to cover that real briefly. So minimally invasive surgery is, is um, something that has to be thought through. Okay. It's not like, it's not a one size fits all, um, set of procedures, if you will, okay? So we don't just do, oh, you you know, everybody gets minimally invasive surgery. Now, some doctors don't have the training or the skill level, and let me tell you, I mean, I had to essentially, to some degree, teach myself, because I was doing minimally invasive surgery um, around in 2003 when it was relatively new. It didn't even really exist until the turn of the century. And of course, it's become more and more popular. I'd still say a lot of people don't do a lot of types of minimally invasive surgery. The first type of minimally invasive surgery was what we call a minimally invasive discectomy. And it's a, it's a great one. Uh, most people are candidates for that one. Um, and that is the biggest difference is what we used to do, and I'll try to show this on a spinal model whenever I have a chance to sit in front of my computer, is we would literally make a midline incision down your back in order to get to the bone. So we have to get to the lamina, that lamina bone that I showed you the other day when we are looking at a spinal model. So we got to get to that lamina. We've got to remove a little bit of that lamina. We've got to remove that yellow ligament. Remember the yellow ligament I talked about? The ligamentum flavum means yellow ligament in Latin. We have to remove that yellow ligament. Then we can see what your, is called your dura, that uh, cellophane thin, see-through, so thin, delicate covering of your uh, caudal equina, which is the uh, termination of your spinal cord. Again, refer back to that hour and a half video if you really want to know this anatomy. We can move that out of the way. We can't move the spinal cord. Remember, the spinal cord ends at L1, L2, but below L1, L2, okay, or your lumbar spine, which is where a lot of things happen, we can just very gently pull those nerve roots out of the way, and then remove that disc, take that disc out. So the difference between a, a non-minimally invasive surgery and minimally invasive surgery is the old way we did it is if we, we well, we'd either do a laminectomy or a discectomy. I know some people would always do a laminectomy, and there's reasons for that, and they're not, they're not bad reasons. Uh, laminectomy is when you remove the entire lamina, and a discectomy is when you just remove a small piece of the lamina and then do what I said, remove the bone, remove the ligamentum, retract the dura, take out the disc that's pressing on the nerves. So whether you do minimally invasive or you do an open, what we call an open procedure, that part is the same. Everything I just described is exactly the same. There's no difference there. The difference is in the approach. The difference is in how you get to that lamina, okay? So in the old procedure, which has been around for decades, you know, people were doing discectomies, uh, you know, all through the 1900s. I'm not sure when they were first described as a discectomy. I'm guessing I'd have to look it up, probably somewhere in the 40s and the 50s, but again, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But they've been going on for a long time. And what you would do is make a midline incision, okay, right over those posterior spinous processes. Remember that anatomy that I was showing you, the posterior spinous processes? And then you would separate the muscle, typically with a bovi cautery, with an electric knife that burns that muscle from the bone all the way down the length of the bone um, and down to the lamina and separate the muscle, uh, good morning, separate the muscle from the bone. And so for, for a discectomy, it's not that big a deal, but it is a bigger incision and you're literally separating the muscle from the bone. And a lot of the pain that people have uh, with any back surgery over the long term is from that muscle being burned off the bone. The muscle sort of is in shock. And with a bigger incision, you can remove inches on either side when you're doing a big, uh, a big fusion. That's when, that's when I think minimally invasive really can be uh, beneficial, in the right, but it has to be in the right patient. 
is when you're separating, you know, a huge surface area of bone, many, many, many square inches of bone, of, of muscle from the bone. And that muscle is just in shock. It's sort of going, rah, you know, and, and, they, and that's where a lot, I think, the pain comes from in that first year as that muscle reattaches, scars in. It doesn't reattach the bone. Most of the time the bone's been removed. It sort of reattaches to other scar tissue. Um, it has to heal. So with a minimally invasive discectomy, the reason it's minimally invasive is because we stick a tube, a dilator. We don't go down the midline. I make my incision midline. That way, if the patient ever has to have a second surgery, they get, I can go through the same incision because it's so easy to simply make that midline incision pull over just a bit. That skin's pretty mobile and then go in from the side. But you come in at an off angle and you stick a dilator down all the way to the area of interest, you use an X-ray to show you where the lamina is on both views, and then you slide tubes over that. So what's the difference? The difference is now, instead of burning muscle from the bone, I'm literally going in between the muscle fibers, and I sequentially dilate until I get to about 14 to 18 millimeters, which is a, which is a very uh, small incision, and I haven't burned any muscle from the bone. I do my work through a microscope, which is the, absolutely the best way to do that. Using loops, I think, is just, I don't know how people do that. With a microscope, a number of things happen. You get 10 times magnification, um, and you have excellent lighting. The lighting is way better than any other lighting, and since you're using it, I use an assistant, my assistant can see exactly what's going on rather than blindly holding a retractor on someone's nerves, which to me is crazy. But anyway, a microscope's absolutely the best way to, and, and that's how, used to be neurosurgeons used microscopes, orthopedists didn't. I'm an orthopedist. Uh, where I trained um, my ortho uh, instructors, if you will, you know, my mentors didn't use a microscope, but I was able to operate with neurosurgeons enough during my fellowship, kind of snuck in there and operated with them um, to decide that I definitely wanted to use a microscope. I've been using a microscope from the day I started practice and, and can't, couldn't imagine not using one, especially for minimally invasive surgery. So you go down through that tube, you're operating through this tiny little hole, which, you know, takes some practice, it's tough. Um, at first, and then when you're done, you take out the disc, you slide the tube out, the muscle fibers just come right back together, and you've done very minimal damage. You have to take a little bit of muscle right there at the surface of the lamina, but it's a fraction of the muscle injury, uh, uh, if you will. For a minimally invasive fusion, I do the same thing, except my incision, my portal's a little bit bigger. Instead of using a solid tube, I use a, a tube that basically has, uh, it's broken into four quadrants, and I can I can, I can adjust it at the top and, and move the distally, move down deep where I want to have my uh, working aperture and, and create the exact aperture that I want, but I'm still doing it through a very small incision. So to give you a perspective, I can do a fusion where normally we would do a big incision on the back. So, and the other thing you have to understand too, just real quickly, uh, because uh, we're working through a portal, it doesn't matter whether you weigh 100 pounds or 500 pounds, the incision's the same. So, that's a, so people who are you know, who are heavy, which that's not healthy. I'm not advocating that, but I'm saying if you're really big and heavy, you really benefit from a minimally invasive surgery because I don't have to make any bigger incision on you than I do on a thin person. Whereas if I'm doing an open procedure and I'm trying to get down deep to do that work, well, in order to, the incision becomes longer and longer as the patient is deeper and deeper because I've got to pull the muscles out of the way to get down deep. And so it really makes a big difference. Um, whereas an incision, an open incision could be many inches long a minimally invasive incision for a discectomy is 18 millimeters, as small as 14 millimeters, somewhere in that range. Some people use a 22 millimeter portal. It really doesn't matter. We're talking less than an inch. And when I do a single level minimally invasive fusion, like I did last week, I do that through a 40 millimeter incision. So we're still talking less than two inches. And, um, and, and again, I'm splitting the muscle fibers and it typically results in a huge reduction in pain. It also typically, in most cases, results in a very minimal amount of blood loss. So for a typical open fusion, especially if someone you know has bleeding issues and their blood pressure is bouncing around, um, it's sort of a it's sort of a vicious cycle because the more bleeding, the longer the surgery takes because you're sucking blood. If the blood pressure is kind of bouncing around, and and it, the surgery takes longer, well, as the surgery takes longer, then you lose more blood. But it's not unusual to lose you know two, three, four hundred cc's cc's of blood milliliters of blood um on a single level fusion and in fact it's really not that unusual to lose a thousand and so when i did a minimally invasive fusion where i put a i did basically did a 360 fusion where i went from the back and put screws in and i did it from one side of it unilaterally this patient was a good candidate for this and it's doing quite well i lost 50 cc's of blood i lost 50 cc's of blood that's three tablespoons of blood um, versus potentially a liter of blood uh, and so there's a lot less blood loss. 
Um, the surgery is in the beginning when you're learning to do uh, minimally invasive uh, procedures, probably takes longer than an open. But once you get proficient at it, and I've been doing it for 15 years, um, more than most surgeons, um, you, uh, you become as fast or faster. And a lot of it depends on the patient's pathology and how difficult the case is otherwise. But the big advantages are um, smaller incisions, less tissue damage, less blood loss, potentially less operative time, and all these things typically lead to, to fewer infections and better recovery. Now, I've seen, I've seen typically young people are tougher and older people are you know not, and minimally invasive should be less painful and open should be more painful. But I've had, a, I remember a 74 year old that had an open procedure on once, she was up, up and out of bed ready to go home the next day. So you can't say 100% that everyone who has minimally invasive is gonna be in less pain. I've seen young people with low pain tolerance apparently have just as much pain, maybe even more than what I would have seen with an open procedure. But generally speaking, for the most part, the minimally invasive procedure is a lot less painful. So, so uh, preservation of um, anatomy, we're splitting the fibers, we don't injure them at all, except right where we're doing our work instead of peeling it down all the way from the top. Typically a lot less blood loss, usually less pain in a quicker recovery. So, so those are the big benefits of minimally invasive. It's not a one size fits all. Depending on exactly what the anatomy of the problem is, trying to do minimally invasive can be uh, the wrong decision in some cases. And a lot of times if someone has had previous surgery and there's gonna be a lot of scar tissue, etc. Although I've actually found that I can uh, do most people's surgery uh, minimally invasive, even if they've had uh, a previous surgery, not always but it has more to do with how much of the canal is compromised. But what I'm doing is I'm doing what, I'm doing a replacement for a 360 fusion, which in a lot of doctors' hands would be an open procedure on the back, many inches long, do that procedure, flip the patient over, then cut a hole in their belly, move their guts out of the way, and then put their cage in from the front. I'm doing that entire surgery all from the back through a 40 millimeter incision, and I've done it more times than I can count. And so that to me is, is minimally invasive. And other people will do the same procedure from the back, flip the patient on the side, again, a second incision, and they're doing what's called an X lift, where they do similar to that anterior procedure, but instead of having to move the guts out of the way, they come from the side, they sort of push the, the peritoneal items uh, at that level out of the way. Unfortunately, there's a lot of um, cases of people with nerve injury that just get some numbness in their leg or some pain in their leg, and it usually goes away. But when, you know, when I went to take the course years ago, they said, <laughs> expect it in everyone. I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to do a procedure where I'm expecting um, you know, a complication, and for, at least for some period of time, and everyone. But there's a lot of people that do that, and I think um, they're happy with that procedure. But again, it's two incisions. They're still doing two incisions where um, you know, I'm not doing a lot of surgery just for disc pain. So if, you're, if someone's got a weak nerve or pressure on their nerve, numbness or tingling, they need to have the pressure taken off their nerves. That always means going from the back and removing a lamina and getting those nerves freed up. If you're just operating on people for only back pain, they don't have any nerve symptoms whatsoever, first of all, you shouldn't be doing that nearly as much as done, in my opinion. And that's really the only case where you can just go from the front or just go from the side and ignore the posterior canal but I don't operate on people generally unless they need to have their nerves freed up. And in those cases, which I consider to be the more legitimate reasons to do spine surgery on people, um, you're gonna end up with two incisions if you do it those other ways. The way I do it, I end up with one incision. Um, I can usually deal with scar tissue from the back. It can be difficult, um, you know, but I've gotten pretty darn good at it. I've done lots of revision surgeries, minimally invasive uh, through scar tissue. If someone's got complete occlusion of their canal. The disc is so big that it's just pressing on everything. I think open is the way to go. If someone has you know, just severe scar tissue, that's the way to go. If someone has multiple levels, probably you know three levels, I'll do a one or two level through minimally invasive, you probably need to open up. You need to be able to see. So to think that minimally invasive surgery is a one size fits all is definitely a big mistake. But anyway, I'll show you guys, um, I'll try to get some maybe some pictures in the OR of the equipment. Um, I actually did video a, minimally, a, a few actually minimally invasive surgeries. Again, I've been reluctant to put blood online. Um, so you guys let me know. Maybe I'll send that out to the mailing list or the people who are truly interested. I'll make a special link and email that to them if they really want to see a surgery. Um, I don't know. It's just been my opinion to not show blood, especially just not throw it on Facebook. It probably would freak people out. It's not, and even though it's really not that much blood, <laughs> especially the 50 cc's, but still it's bloody. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so minimally, minimally invasive surgery is wonderful. It's not for every patient. Every patient needs to be looked at individually. We still try to fix people 
uh, with everything but surgery, just because it's minimally invasive, it's still spine surgery. We still encourage weight loss, better nutrition, uh, activity modification, um, uh, epidural, you know, pain management, epidural steroids, steroid injections, and things like that. But when minimally invasive surgery is uh, indicated, it's an option, it's a wonderful option, and it works out really well for the majority of patients. And so, uh, anyway, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit, see how what the interest level was. A lot of people, you know, see that I call myself a minimally invasive surgeon, what does that mean? Well, I've tried to explain that very basically. There's a little bit more to it than what I've said, but those are the basic, those are, those are, those are the things that matter. Um, smaller incisions, and the incision is not really, that's probably the least important. It's what we're doing to the soft tissues after we make that incision that really makes it minimally invasive. It's the fact that we're losing a lot less blood uh, that makes it minimally invasive and that the recovery and the pain from surgery generally is uh, uh, a lot better with uh, minimally invasive. All right, guys, remember, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Spine Center of Texas Facebook page, get on there, join the mailing list, and win a free t-shirt. You guys have a great day.